Good morning, everyone. And this is Mahal Amir. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the introduction. And thanks to Imkan for giving us the opportunity to be part of this uh, conference and to meet uh, such professional educators around the kingdom and uh, around the world, maybe. Uh, uh, resilience. If we talk about resilience and if we look at the educational literature, usually it refers to a, to resilient or to a resilient school as a school that encourages resilience in its students. Yet it cannot do that without being resilient itself. And you can see this in the practices of its faculty and staff, of course. Is it important for schools? Of course, we all agree that we are dynamic communities and we face changes and challenges every day and every time. But what happened last year with the pandemic, it made it very clear the importance of creating a culture of resilience in each school. Those who had it from last year till now could survive and they made it. Those who didn't have struggled even to stay, af to stay afloat, unfortunately. So this brings the importance of creating a culture of resilience. But at the beginning, as you said, let's define resilience. Let's you know, have a common understanding of what resilience is. If we just look at the dictionary, it would uh, define the resilience as the ability to be happy, successful again, after something difficult or bad happened to you. The ability of a substance to return to its usual shape after being bent, stretched or pressed. What about psychology with humans? Courtney Eckerman defines resilience as follows. Resilience is the quality of recovering quickly from failure and adversity. Okay, here we have to put lines, okay? Recovering quickly from adversity and not only returning to the status quo, but actually using the opportunity to grow and further your personal development in terms is change or challenge and opportunity. It's the concept of changing any challenge into an opportunity. And this is what happened like last year. Actually, there is nothing more adverse or hard or difficult than the pandemic that you know it affected the whole world, not only schools. Definitely. Our school at the beginning of this year in our training time, we said our objective for this year is to tr transform each challenge into an opportunity. And in the coming slides or discussion, we will say how we did that. Yes. Great. Okay, now uh, I thought of like sharing with you what, the, what are the latest uh, studies about uh, resilience, especially after the pandemic, because you know, I think it, it's changed the whole world. So let's have a two minutes of uh, watching this video, and then we will discuss a study that was done by Deloitte for uh, yeah, many, many organizations, different organizations, to find out what are the main characteristics or traits of a resilient organization. Enjoy watching, and then I will see you later. Thank you, Ms. Maha. Our world is full of disruption, but it is also full of resilience. From the immortal jellyfish that can be endlessly reborn to the mighty oak that can live for hundreds of years, resilience is all around us. The past year has taught businesses some hard lessons about disruption and perseverance, with the most successful organizations displaying attributes embodied by our resilient world. Preparedness is one such attribute. 2020 has shown that strategy and preparation are crucial to coping with unexpected disruption. CXOs must assess every situation, thinking several moves ahead, taking the risks required to win. Then there's adaptability, an obvious resilience trait, but perhaps the most difficult to achieve. Resilient organizations must be fluid, able to move in new directions and instantly adapt to any circumstance. Third is collaboration, essential in today's environment and beyond. To succeed, we need to recognize the power and potential of working together, using our individual strengths to complement one another, creating solutions we couldn't devise on our own. Then comes trust. It's built in normal times, but tested in hard times. Business leaders must constantly show commitment and credibility, so others instinctively know they'll be there when needed most. 
Finally, there's responsibility. To make our world a better place, leaders must serve others selflessly while protecting their own organizations. These five traits are what every business needs to be truly resilient, to form the strongest of foundations, enabling it to weather any storm. Okay, so Ms. Maha, now that we've defined resilience uh, and we've seen how it looks like and what a resilient school should do, can you tell us more about your experience and how you exhibited those traits throughout the past year? Yes, of course. Uh, as you said, okay, this is the latest study that says that the, there are five traits or characteristics of a resilient organization. I will try to relate our culture in DAS and how it, you know, it aligns with those characteristics. Number one, they said it's the organization has to be prepared, okay? So it's preparedness, collaboration. I'll, I'll just mention them and then we go to slide by slide. So to be prepared, collaborative, adaptable, trustworthy, and the last one is responsible. Let's look at the image of the pillars. This requires, required from our school, actually, thank God that we have a very strong collaborative culture in the school, depending on what we call our pillars, which are the pillars of the PLC. And I'm sure Imkan had maybe a conference about professional learning communities before. And this is what we have been doing for, for some time, for many years behind, actually, not for some time. So the uh, the culture the organizational culture of the school as a professional learning community helped us very much to be a resilient school mm -hmm. when we say plc professional learning community what comes to your mind sara and to the others number one or pillar number one is your clear value as you okay. can see in this image what is the biggest thing what is the the thing on the top of everything student it's learning students learning so yeah. we are very clear about our clear value our main responsibility is student learning, okay? So having this, okay, we always say we never stop teaching. We never lower our expectation. And we walk the talk. We usually say it and do it, alhamdulillah. So by having this culture of focus on students learning, it helped us a, a, a lot to be a resilient school. So yeah. this was the beginning, that is the students learning as a biggest value. Can we move to the next, next slide? slide? Okay. So how did we prepare ourselves as a, as a professional learning community? And it, it did not happen last year only. As I said, it happens many years ago, but you know, it's a journey. As we all know that professional learning communities are ongoing processes and a journey that never stops. We so have the point is it was well anchored throughout your culture within the past years. When, yes. when the pandemic happened, you just enjoyed that strong foundation that we've already established. Yes, thank you very much, Sara. That's that's correct. So uh, our focus on students learning, having the culture of the prof professional learning community anchored, and you know, just using it in that hard and difficult time. When we say professional learning community, we know that we have teams for each and group with a smart goal for each team, and this ha this has been the norm in our school. We have yeah. structured sufficient time meetings for the uh, the different gr groups. We spent a lot of time removing or reducing silos and increasing collaboration, especially between different groups, groups of different subjects in our school or teams between boys and girls. As you may know that as a Saudi you know, school, we have separate schools, but yeah. now we're all one. We have the teams, they collaborate together, they plan together. So this idea of collaboration and structured time have helped us a lot in providing this culture of resilience and collaboration. That's usually a challenge within different, in, in one school that serves both boys and girls. They're usually, they usually operate as two separate entities. So I'm really happy to see that uh, you managed to find a way to overcome that challenge. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, we've been you know, trying for so many years. We have, mashallah, great leaders and you know, great people in our leadership program. They're very efficient. They, yeah, and they're doing it and it became, as I said, the norm. Now we enjoy the idea of collaboration. Why, before it was a struggle and a challenge. Now it's the norm and we enjoy it very much, alhamdulillah. We have trained leaders and coaches to take a mentoring approach. As you could have seen from the pillars, we, we, we have one column saying al-musanada or support. Okay, we don't ask only people or teachers to stand by their own and work together. They're in a team. 
and there is a mentor to help and support their learning and their shared learning and testing of what they learn and experiencing the new ideas. So this musanada or support, it's the mentoring approach that we use in Dahran Ahliya to support. So we would not expect very high from our staff or from our students not to give them the support they, they need, okay? Exactly. So this also helped a lot. The collaboration, we will talk about it when we talk about collaborative. Um, I have to say something here. Part of our strategy, continuous development or improvement strategy is that we have a motto that mm -hmm. we really value very much. It's in the heart and the brain, of, I think, of each and every person in our school. We say every year we will be better than we were the year before. And in Arabic, we say, And it's a logo or a motto. You may say, and you know what, and you don't say, Alhamdulillah, we walk the talk again. The smart goals, the responsibility that is built inside each and every team member in our school, they know they have their own goals for their students. They want to share with the whole community. That's why we have something called the annual celebration of progress, not excellence, not it's progress, the progress that has been done in one year. Okay. It's an event only for staff or staff and students? Well, actually, it's only for staff. We invite some people from you know the community, like from the educational community and the volunteer mothers who come and serve, and you know, the advisory board and the alumni board. And this event, it happens every year after the first semester, beginning of the second semester. We celebrate the progress that was done in light of the SMART goals, the big strategic SMART goals of the schools and the SMART goals of each team that support the big idea, okay? And usually we have it in a big hall, you know, with corners for each team. But as we said, we're adaptable. How you did have you to do, do it this, this year? year? Yeah, virtually, of course. <laughs> and to tell you reality, it was a great success, alhamdulillah. You think it had the same feeling and the same energy? Well, actually, it had the same energy. The okay. feeling, you know, sometimes I, I am a human person. I like, you know, human connection. I wish I saw okay. people in front of me. But, okay. but alhamdulillah, yani, what we heard from our staff, that it was a success. The main objectives we usually have were accomplished uh, in that meeting. That's I will show you some examples. Uh, in that corner, it could be, as I said, a real corner or a virtual corner. Each team would have the pride to present their goal for the year, their achievements in light of that goal and other achievements they did, and their plans for next year. So this is what we say that it's a journey of progress and continuous improvement. It's not that I achieved very high, we're among the best, and so that's it. No, we look yeah. at the data, we analyze the data, and we find out new you know, uh, goals to work on. So uh, I'll just and I guess uh, I guess sometime in our discussion we'll 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 dig deeper into how you collect data and how you an analyze data. Yes, yeah, we will come to it. Uh, okay. Can can we show them? Yeah, look at this. This is find a uh, kind uh, part of a poster for Fariq al Ulum Riyadiyat. It shows uh, it's I think it's below. Uh, it's math and science uh, team. Uh, they show their goals here. Okay. For example, they have a goal for Tahsili and Qudurat for the students. That's why we have a focus on Tahsili and Qudurat here uh, using electronic, you know, uh, the teams because we are virtual now. So they had this as a goal for them and they show how much they uh, achieved in this goal. The next slide would show the data. Look at the data we're talking about. They're very proud that their students in, in AP courses are getting high scores and they put the scores and comparison yani subject to subject or year to year so we can find out how we progress in our work in the school. So this is part of a teamwork, okay? This is their data. This is what they are proud about. This is what they need to work on. So they usually have a part for what is next or what are your next goals? So, so as a curiosity, Ms. Maha, do you have a data unit in your school or is it that each department is just responsible for collecting their data and coming up with the uh, findings? Well, actually, yes, we do have a, uh, we call it research unit. It's actually the data unit, as you said, okay. which uh, helps in, you know, administrating a standardized assessment, collect the data, and we have it in the research or data unit. Uh, teams يعني, are given these data, of course. Each team has its own data, but we yeah. have a unit that is in charge of all 
the standardized assessment, the surveys, and the, the data that the school for the for the whole school. Yes, and it oh. gives a very big support actually to the teams and to to the administration in uh, in terms of like the data analysis and uh, keeping and documentation. Very. Good. Uh, we move to the next slide. It will show this is Fariq al Iftidai. This is the PYP first and second and KG later on. So from KG to grade 12, we have teams according either to grade level or to subject, as we said, unified boys and girls, if we have you know, this unification. So here, first and second, they have their um, academic uh, goal and they show the data related to that goal. And they are sharing this with other teams in the school. So uh, someone from like the other teams would come and ask, how did you achieve that? Why did you achieve that? So it's part of it is shared experience, okay? Because they're sharing what they did. And uh, part of it is uh, transparency, transparency within the team, within the school. And I will show you how it, it becomes with the wider community. Because from this data and from this informa uh, information we have, we have an annual report that goes to the parents and to the community that we yeah. will have some time to talk about later on. Okay. This is part of what they are proud of, the virtual classroom in our KG. This is Fariq Riyad al Atfar or the KG team. So they shared some of uh, their virtual classroom for others to see and how they created that. So this is part of the annual celebration of progress. Okay. And uh, by the way, we do this for teachers, for faculty, and also for staff. Even for administrators, they have their goals. They move from their goals boys and girls, and they exchange these uh, those experiences, okay? I'm happy you also celebrate Advents, school Advents, because they're usually very much forgotten in any school celebration. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, well, it took us some time. We started, of course, a yani, long time ago with teachers. Yeah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, yani, by 2013, 14, we started it with Advents. It wasn't yeah. easy, as you said, because even in uh, the educational literature, you don't have enough for Advents. Yeah. But uh, يعني, alhamdulillah, we were we were able to move on. Still, we need a lot of work, as you know. And, and uh, but um, but we're we're doing it, and they have the responsibility now, and Definitely. you know, of owning their yeah. own goals. So the first pillar is to be prepared as a school to take a step to take to be prepared by ten steps ahead of time um, in case um, anything happens. You make sure that you have a strong culture, and that's the first pillar. And the yeah. second pillar is. And the second one is collaborative, which is part of the PLC. And luckily, in our case, as schools, that the preparation would require everything, you know, the four traits that they mentioned in the study, in the Deloitte study. So collaborative, but I will give it some time because we know, and I'm sure that the people are, who are listening to us are all, you know, educators, and they may be, they're applying the PLC. Collaboration yeah. makes our life easy and more fruitful. It's the power of coming together. It removes silos. No one is just doing what he wants to do. It encourages, you know, shared uh, learning, shared the decision making. You coming up with new solutions. One head is not like ten heads together, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So this is what we did. How we did it in Dahran Ali, as you, as we, uh, I said before, we have dedicated times scheduled every week for teams to meet with a mentor. And that would support them, you know, to move towards you know, achieving their goals. So we have a structure, we have professional collaboration, systematic shared uh, documentation. Uh, after they meet, they plan together, they discuss, they have their data uh, together. So they share their failures and successes, and they come up with new ways of improving their failures and continuing with their successes. And we also have a systematic way of shared documentation. We have what we call the electronic binder. Now, because, you know, as an international school, we have a curriculum that is built in the school. Okay, it's not only one textbook. So we have in that binder, the teams work together to create that uh, uh, curriculum. We, it is not in the files of one person, of one teacher. It's in the electronic it's open and it's accessible to everyone. It's accessible to everyone, okay? And then we can look at it next year and improve it from there or change from there, but it's accessible to everyone. Thank you so much. And I as I said- A little bit tricky. Okay, so collaboration throughout our experience, we've seen some, it takes time for you to build trust. 
for you to actually practice PLCs rather than just have um, allocated meeting, meeting slots in the schedule where people just sit and talk, but to, to have actual deep collaboration to promote student learning. Would I, as a teacher, feel safe to share my mistakes and to share my learnings inside the classroom and be vulnerable with my colleagues. So um, it really does take time, I think, right? Yeah. Yes, it does, actually. And we went through different stages, by the way. Alhamdulillah, we have a very strong academic you know, team mm -hmm. and uh, they help and support in directing the, you know, this, uh, the whole process. Uh, they usually plan it. They have a schedule every week that goes to every team, okay? The teams have their own, of course, but yani, they structure it. Otherwise, as you said, it will be just meeting for nothing, but because they have the goals, okay? And we have like structured, very well planned, let me say, allocated meetings, uh, meeting times, uh, it becomes very fruitful. And it, we did not succeed from the first year, like any other organiza organization. We started, uh, um, I will explain the PDSA. Okay. So, Okay, we plan and then we do, and then we study. Okay, we did not do it, still we need to work. Then we have another plan. So we need this cycle of what they call the PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act. And that's actually the third trait as well. And this the is adaptability. adaptability, yes, yeah. okay. So when, when we come to the adaptable, how, how the school is adaptable, and many, I'm sure other schools are adaptable too, how did we do it? Is by having this culture of, uh, maybe you noticed in the in the film, he said, you have clear goals, okay? And we have clear goals, it's our students learning, okay? But yeah. you can be adaptable and fluid moving into different directions, okay? So I have my goals, I have my expectations, but there are challenges. So I yeah. need to, to use different ways. And this is what we do by planning and doing, like last year. This year is much better than last year. Last year was good when we had you know, the sudden attack of the pandemic and we had to say, yalla, go home. Uh, thank God again, we have a strong academic team and we have a strong IT team. So, and the administration you know, made it possible for them to collaborate together, to come up with solutions. They were meeting like every day at the beginning to find you know, the, the, the good platform to organize ourselves more. So we did very well, but I'm sure, but the, by the end of that year, we started, you know, uh, improving and acting again. Uh, by the way, one of the examples, if you are interested, it was looking at the best practices in distance learning because yeah. there wasn't much about it in the you know educational literature. So and during summer, people were looking and we uh, yeah, and we were lucky to have a, a book, okay, called Distance Learning Toolkit. And then we contacted the author, John, John Haiti, I think. Okay, and we, the, our academic heads, they took training from John Haiti himself, okay, for distance learning during summer vacation. And then they started, you know, uh, training the teams. He's, on, he's okay. by the way, a guru in, 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 in student learning and using data, utilizing data to uh, promote visible learning, learning that you can actually feel and see. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. So, yeah, we've been doing this. This was an example of this year, and we have examples of other years. Like, for example, when we started the bilingual program. Bilingual yeah. program was not easy even um, to be you know, understood even by parents, okay? It, it is challenging. And moving, uh, changing the curriculum to be bilingual, uh, yeah, and it wasn't very easy, but again, we got uh, the help from an international educator, an expert in, in, uh, in bilingualism and bilingual education. So, so for those who don't know, by the way, I'm just gonna take a few seconds to clarify. Al Dahran Al Ahliya School utilizes a very unique bilingual program. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Maha. Uh, yeah. You switch from Arabic to English every other year, correct? Or every yes. every term? Every year, every year. Actually, we focus on the mother tongue, the Arabic language, because yeah, in the I foundation mean, of years, identity. We yeah. have you know, like 25 to 30 percent time for the English language from K to two. And when it comes to third grade, we start uh, science in English, math in Arabic. In grade four, we switch. It becomes math in English and science in Arabic. In and you keep on switching school. until high school, correct? Until grade eight. In yeah. grade eight, our students, we have a strategic goal, by the way, for ourselves, that our students should be ready in both languages, okay? Mm -hmm. So they have the choice to choose between the Muqarrarat program, which is a local Saudi program, enriched, of course, by Dharan Ahliya, and the, uh, the, uh, the diploma program, the DP. 
it's a diploma, American diploma, but we, inshallah, we will be moving to DP very soon. Okay, so they have the choice by the end of grade eight. Uh, at the beginning, it wasn't easy, uh, and we were PDSA planning and doing. You and really so, have to be adaptable, extremely adaptable. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's a, a real example. If you keep on switching okay. math and science every single year, you really but, have to be super but, adaptable. But we work very hard on the scope and sequence and the materials we use. It mm. is, yeah, and you improve each, each and every year. So when the people and uh, yeah, even parents found uh, the use of that, alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah. And now it shows. And, now, and by, by the way, research says that those kids who speak more than la the language and think in more than la one language, they become smarter. Yeah, I, I think they have parents. more yeah. critical thinking, let me say, not smarter, but more critical thinking. Okay, okay. let's uh, discuss the fourth okay. and fifth Traits. Trustworthy and responsible, you may not take a long time. They always say trust is built in normal times, but tested in adverse and hard times. We all agree, right? So this is what happened. Because we have a focus on our value, main value, which is you know students learning, and the people see the work that we're doing for that. Um, and we try to, you know, be transparent communicate with our stakeholders, mainly parents and other, you know, community educational uh, agencies. Uh, so this transparency, trying to be credible and communicating our information, yeah, and it made it easier for us to be trust more trustworthy. Okay? okay, so and balancing all the needs uh, of all stakeholders, you know, it was a difficult time. We know that parents had and to take a lead in their children education during the pandemic. They were the teachers inside the houses, right? And so they had to collaborate a lot with the with our teachers. So, but because alhamdulillah, we have that bank of trust, it showed, and we improve it by, you know, uh, immediate com communication. Uh, to tell you reality, we worked very hard. Some of the examples we did is we listened to them through the surveys. We had this semester almost 10 to 11 surveys. Mm -hmm. Some of them are getting like feedback, real feedback from them and for us to do some actions. Examples of the actions we, we did, for example, is we, uh, we had flexible schedules, okay, for our students. Uh, we put our uh, students, this is before even, the, that was our decision. We reduced the number of students in each class. Instead of having a teacher having 20 students, we made it, especially for the lower grades, to, not, to have not more than 10 or 12 students. So she can focus on them virtually, okay? So the number of students was reduced according to grade level. Um, we, ha we, we had okay, some so the point is, Ms. Maha, uh, you established trust because you asked for their opinion and then you acted on it. So as a yeah. parent, I see that you actually listened to me. Yeah, you yeah. responded to my needs. And that's yeah. how you basically established trust. Yeah, with respect and empathy, of course, to all stakeholders. And we have announced policies and procedures. And we know this, this builds yeah. trust in schools if you have you know, uh, announce policies and procedures that you go by them. Uh, the annual report is a kind of thing that made it possible for us to, to take their trust because we share with them everything every year. Even and we'll be discussing the annual report. We will, we will, inshallah. Oh, oh, and responsible, it's organizational responsibility, team responsibility and individual responsibility. So it was very clear from the other points that we were discussing as a PLC. Yeah. Uh, the, yes. But just for other schools who are, who, uh, who are working on the professional learning community, because we really recommend it, and that DAS pillars, which are based on Tamam, we recommend all the work, and you know, done by Richard Dofor and you know his team. Learning by doing was one of the one of the books. Okay, that are very important, and then that helped us in our journey actually. And uh, to tell you reality, part of our social responsibility, we have a translation house. It translated it into Arabic because we believe that we need more resources in Arabic. So Ta'allam an Tariq al Amal and other books by Dofor is available uh, if, yani, if they want to improve or enhance or reinforce their PLC culture in this school. Okay. Sorry, uh, Ms. Maha. So um, let's dig deeper into your annual report. And I heard you publish it um, on an annual basis. And you do that with complete transparency over all of your operations. It really reflects every single thing that you have done throughout the year, including your financial performance, which is something that we don't, we're not really exposed to um, as school uh, stakeholders. 
So why do you publish the report and how do you do it? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to say the definition, you said it, <laughs> of the annual report is sharing the most important, you know, information to all stakeholders every year. And it is usually done by, you know, companies and, and you know, financial organizations. But as a school, maybe th this is not the norm in schools, but we thought of doing it because of different reasons. One of them is to keep the school community updated regarding the main outcomes we have in the school. Number two is to ensure our commitment to transparency and uh, integrity, okay? So communication with parents. Uh, to get support if we need it, I mean, in, in, in a way or another from our alumni and school community, to document and to provide materials for us and that can help us for, sel for self-study purposes. Okay, so this documentation, okay, and could help us later on in self-study document, uh, I mean, uh, practices. Okay, Ms. Maha, uh, just for the sake of time, can we uh, jump in to show the report? I think we have a slide on the report. Yes, okay. Because this we need to start right. taking questions. People are just showering you with questions. I, I will just tell you three questions, three things we usually cover. It's a three mm -hmm. sections. Section number one is the strategic, uh, you know, goal and the general strategy of the school and the milestones related to it. And I will show you how. The second one is the achievements and outcomes of the school. Of course, mainly students' outcomes from K to 12, okay? And boys and girls. The third is the, the resources, which is part of it is the financial file and the enabling uh, factors. And we will see how we show it. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, these are examples, just pictures of things that we usually keep. And uh, the report is accessible to all through your website, correct? Yes, you can just go to, uh, we publish it in all social media. You yeah. can uh, find it in our uh, Twitter account, okay? It is pub published already there. It was published, I think, by end of January or beginning of February. This okay. is the process of how we collect data. We create, a, for number one, the data is available, okay? This is very important. Otherwise, yani, you cannot publish something that does not exist. And yeah. we start search, we have some one person who is in charge of collecting and you know organizing the whole process. We start each year with revising the suitable data to be approved and included in the report. Yeah. Examine the best annual reports of schools and companies to perceive new ideas. Okay, so we update it every year. I gave you a list of our annual reports. If you go to the first one, it would be completely different from the yeah. last one because we have been, been doing this for the past seven years or seven years. years. Yes, we started in 2013, actually. Yeah. Assign a budget for the uh, electronic design and agree if we need to. Develop a general proposal and obtain a, an approval from the school's administration and advisory board. Distribute the tasks and topics in uh, to each department because it comes from each department, from different departments according to the specialization with the data of submission, schedule content review by persons in charge of each section, and then collecting and proofreading by the assigned employee. Okay. Deliver, yeah. Deliver the whole content to the designer, either inside our school or outside. Resend the content, content for a vinyl revision by the leaders committee, and send the file electronically for, envi for environmental sustainability, we don't use paper anymore, okay, okay, to the school community and publish it also on the school website and all social media. And I guess, so maybe it's some of the steps are very um, logistical, but the key and the foundation remains in collecting data. So it's an ongoing process, not yes. something that you uh, start doing at the end of the year. Yes, sure. Okay. The, the, uh, main, the key point, yes, yeah. Oh. Okay, so on the website, they can access all of your reports starting off 2011, correct? Yes, 11-12 uh, 12, 12 until 2019 for last year. Okay. Okay, a part of our social uh, responsibility, uh, we know that uh, there is a lack of, you know, um, uh, materials, resources in Arabic. So uh, we can provide the school, and yani has thought of uh, helping other schools to build their capacity by getting resources, especially in Arabic, translated through Dar al-Kitab or uh, Namu Center, Marquez Namu. These are part of our organization and they can support in that, in that uh, direction. Thank you, Ms. Mahab. So um, 
I'm honestly, as an educator and as a parent, I'm really impressed uh, with the efforts that you've been doing, not only the report, but um, the legacy of Madars al Bahran al Ahliya. It's the pride of um, Saudi education. Um, and uh, so thank you so much for your openness and um, deprivatizing your practice, not only um, within your schools, but also with the community. Uh, through opening your doors and opening your books and sharing all of that uh, with anyone who's interested in, uh, in, in, your, in, in your experience. Uh, now let's get to the questions. I see uh, a lot of questions in chat. One little, one little comment, I'm representing the school and the school leadership actually. And to tell you reality, uh, part of our mission statement before it was to, uh, to support and uh, improve education in the Arab world. Okay, so we think this is part of our responsibility. No need to thanks. We're there to help and support. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Ms. Maha. So let's start with, uh, with some of the questions we have. Uh, okay, so many schools have their values board, but they're only theoretical. Uh, what would you recommend for school leaders to activate their values across the school? Activate, activating values, number one, is that you have a system for communicating your mission, vision, and values. And I think the educational literature has ways of doing this. And by walking the talk, if you don't do it yourself, the values will not be you know, uh, spread in your community. So number one, be an example, be a model of the values of your school. Uh, put them as part of each and every meeting you have. Structure meetings for discussion of your values and goals and make it part of, of your daily and, you know, and annual planning. Yeah. And of course, okay. as we said, to have a very clear mission, vision, uh, you know, targeted characteristics or what they call student profile and Perfect. communicate it well to the school members. Okay, one last question. Um, and I'm, I really do apologize to the attendees for not being able to respond to everyone. Please feel free to reach out to the school on, on social media. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're out of time. So one last question. Uh, how, what do you suggest for a school um, to start uh, producing the report if they don't have a data team or a data unit, research team? Well, actually, maybe they don't have to have research data, but they have to have data. Otherwise, yeah. they will be spending all day, their time not focusing on students, but focusing on data. This has to be developed yani, over the years. And uh, they have to be very careful about you know, how to collect data. You have, they have to have people trained to know how to use data. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. it can turn the way the, um, around against them. Okay, So yeah. uh, I believe that they should have a very strong culture on, and the skills of having data, analysis of data, and making use of data. Uh, it does not have to be a data unit or a research unit. It could be part of your administration. It depends on the school. But yeah. this culture and this has to be in the school. Okay, thank you, Ms. Maha. And my, apolo my sincere apologies again to the um, attendees for not being able to respond to your questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Maha, for your um, openness. And I truly hope that you have enjoyed the session as much as I did. Yes. And I hope the attendees also have, uh, have enjoyed it.